Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Taufik, uh, for helping with the organizing and uh, congratulations, Dr. Raji, for this excellent effort and uh, putting up such a great program. So we have a real feast, as Dr. Vidya Sagar and Dr. Sunny have uh, already mentioned. I don't want to repeat the same thing. We also have a great faculty here to moderate the sessions today. So we have uh, Dr. Junaid Khan, whom uh, all of you know, he's the uh, uh, consultant neonatologist and he's currently uh, at uh, uh, Abu Dhabi. And Dr. Ayman Rahmani, he's uh, head of neonatology at Tawam Hospital. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Mahmoud Al Halik, who is a consultant neonatologist and head of neonatology at Latifa Hospital. And we have Dr. Uh, Khalid Dattavi, who is also a well-known neonatologist in the region. He's a consultant neonatologist at Latifa Hospital as well. We also have Dr. Rajiv, who will join them as a moderator. So uh, we have an excellent session waiting. And uh, congratulations again to the team who has put up a great show. Thank you, Taufik, again. I hand over to Taufik and Dr. Rajiv to continue the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sridhar. So I'd request uh, Dr. Ayman Rahmani to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Patrick. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, those few in uh, UAE. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, part of the faculty of this uh, excellent uh, uh, seminar. Uh, it's given me a great honor and privilege to introduce the first speaker of this session. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Patrick McNamara, he's uh, coming to us from University of Iowa. Uh, Dr. McNamara is Chief of Division of the Neonatal Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics uh, and Internal Medicine at University of Iowa. Uh, he has a long resume. Um, he uh, uh, currently uh, is a Chair of Pan American Hemodynamic Collaborative uh, and Pediatric Academy uh, Society of Neonatal Hemodynamic Advisory and Neonatal Hemodynamic. Uh, he has special interest uh, in the, the American Society of Echocardiography. His clinical research interests include uh, myocardial performance in the setting of hemodynamic significant ductus arteriosus and pulmonary hypertension and targeted neonatal echocardiography. He has published 300, over 300 peer review uh, publications, chapters, and other works. Uh, he's going to tackle a very difficult topic uh, that we face in everyday practice of neonatology, which is uh, the hemodynamic management of PDA. And uh, to add to this difficulty in the context of uh, BPD, uh, it's my uh, privilege to introduce Dr. Patrick McNamara. Good morning, Ayman. Can you see the slides? Yes, yes I can see. Okay, perfect. Okay, so thank you everyone for uh, this wonderful invitation and I applaud the organizers for putting together kind of a very thoughtful uh, program. Um, I also applaud them for um, what I would say somewhat precedenting, precedent setting of um, reminding everyone that what happens in the lung is not just about the lung. And I think that's, I think as we move into the kind of the, the current era of neonatology, I think it's increasingly becoming recognized that if we are to provide the optimal care, <clears throat> we need to think of patients in a much more holistic manner. We gotta recognize the relationship between heart, brain, lungs, and so forth. And in particular, the modulator role uh, from a BPD perspective of the heart in terms of kind of the, the findings that we actually see. <clears throat> So with respect to the ductus arteriosus, it's, it's unbelievable that it's, it's, it's long before I was born, 1956 was the very first report by Mostyn Powell that premature infants with an ongoing ductus arteriosus get respiratory symptomatology. And if we look at, at the time I started off neonatology, which was 1997, um, doing training in the UK, at that point in time, if you look at the contemporary literature, it looks like we had solved the problem. Trials of early surgery showed a reduction in both lung injury and bowel injury. 
and the trials of medical therapy, and this is Ron Kleinman's meta-analysis at the time, suggested that the earlier you intervene, the more likely you are to have a reduction um, both in respiratory and bowel morbidity. <clears throat> but if you look at the year 2020-21, um, a lot has changed over the last 15 years. And if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, and this is data from the Canadian Neonatal Network, uh, where I had the privilege to work at SickKids until 2018, you can see that kind of the last 10 to 15 years have been dominated by a secular movement away from both medical and surgical therapy and an increase in this concept of conservative therapy. The fundamental question today is, is this the appropriate way to manage these patients? And then for the specific purposes of the talk today, how might these secular changes impact our rates of chronic lung disease? If you look at the data and you look at potentially the reasons why uh, physicians have moved away from, I would say, aggressive intervention. First, there are data that spontaneous closure occurs. And if you look at bigger babies over 1,200 grams, what you can see is the vast majority of those infants by three weeks of life will have spontaneous closure. However, if you look at babies under 750 grams who really reflect the highest risk patients of all neonatal morbidity, the fundamental question to be asked is, is exposure of over half of these babies to an average of more than 50 days an acceptable risk? The second question one needs to ask is, how does spontaneous closure occur? And we actually have no idea how does spontaneous closure occur in these babies. Is it, we assume, a process of natural remodeling? And again, bear in mind that the immature ductus is very different in its architecture to the term ductus. It's got less muscle, it doesn't have vasorum, and so forth. Which raises the question, is closure through another mechanism? through augmentation in pulmonary vascular resistance, through remodeling of the pulmonary vessels, are we leading to a reduction in net um, uh, flow across the ductus through the differential pressure gradient across the PDA? If this was the case, that would be concerning. The second reason, and probably the most compelling reason that has moved the field away from kind of aggressive intervention is Bill Bennett's meta-analysis. Uh, which basically shows whether it's medical or surgical therapy, uh, treatment closes the PDA, but based on these trials, there was no difference in any of the neonatal morbidities, including lung disease. So how do we think about this contemporary literature? Well, I recently gave a talk at the AAP meeting and uh, one of the trainees presented a case of a one month old infant who is dependent on a ventilator with a moderate size PDA and left to right shunt. And I was asked the question, would I surgically close this ductus? And my answer was, I don't know. I don't have enough information. All you're telling me is that the ductus is patent. They proceeded to say that then the baby developed some subjective increase in left heart volume loading using the LA to AO ratio. Again, I'm uncertain. And part of the reason for the uncertainty is we know from imaging data that subjective assessment of size, size of vessel, size of chamber is highly unreliable with kappa coefficients as low as 0.2 for many of these measurements. Which gets us to the fundamental question. When we look at the trials, and I think it's incredibly important that we, when we think about evidence, we think about evidence in terms of is it relevant to practice today? And Based on the way in which we evaluate the problem, was there diagnostic homogeneity and did we truly appraise the problem in the trials? The second question we need to ask is who were the controlled patients? And ultimately, and I think this is the holy grail, and if anything, I think the data from the past had certainly taught us that extremes in practice are probably not good. So if we look at imaging data, so this is Kurt Deval's meta-analysis of all the trials. Up to 40% of the randomized trials did not have echo. Secondly, and this is an image here, and this is Dr. Ed Bell, who is one of my colleagues and uh, 
uh, former um, kind of leader in the field. And uh, this is Ed in the 1970s using echocardiography. But why I put this picture up is that the tools available in the 70s and the 80s were not very good compared to what we have available today. So image quality is fundamental to all imaging based research analysis. <clears throat> and the reason for that is, again, you know, across the world, uh, the standard by which people adjudicate whether or not to intervene uh, for the ductus is basically the size of the vessel. And, you know, in the image on the right hand side here, you can see this nice red jet, which reflects a left to right shunt. Um, however, if your image quality is poor or the operator um, has got, is inexperienced, there may be operator and equipment dependent error. And when we looked at a whole range of echo parameters that tell us about shunt volume, the two measurements with the highest degree of inter-rater reliability issues were PDA diameter and the LA to AO ratio, which unfortunately reflects the standard of care in most programs because most people are reliant on pediatric cardiology to provide these evaluations. So it's not surprising when you look, and this is some work that Fernando, Fernando Martins did with us when he did his PhD in Toronto kind of about five years ago, when you look at the relationship of diameter, whether it's indexed or not, to all of these markers that tell you is there fundamental dysregulation in either pulmonary blood flow or systemic blood flow, you can see that the R squared values are low. And that doesn't mean that diameter is not important, but what it's telling us is that flow is not just dependent on diameter, it's dependent on many other things which we will come back to. The other reason where a singular focus potentially is problematic is that we are looking at a three-dimensional structure and making a two-dimensional interpretation. And if you look at these images here, these PDAs come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Straight through is the classic cylindric shape PDAs, but we have funnel shape PDAs, serpentine shape PDAs. And why this is relevant is our assumption is when we take a single plane assessment of the vessel, we're assuming in cross-section that it is circular. The images on the right hand side are pathological reconstructions of vessels um, from postmortem. And what you can see is that the shape of the ductus in cross section is highly variable. And why that's relevant is if you take the second picture at the top here, you may have overestimation or significant underestimation of the size of this vessel based on wherever your imaging plane is. So we need to move beyond single point estimates. The second major reason for concern with looking at contemporary data is unfortunately, we really have not done the desired trial, which is to identify patients who have the most problematic shunts and randomize them to intervention and not provide intervention for a substantial period of time in the control group. Even the PDA tolerate trial, there was up to 63% of patients receive medical therapy. So in essence, what we've done in the trials is we've compared treatment to treatment at another point in time. And the final thing, I think that two final points that I think are incredibly important with respect to interrogation of the literature is, is the data contemporary? And if you actually look at the studies that constituted Bill's meta-analysis, the median year of publication was 1994 which is prior to me even starting off in neonatology. And this is highly relevant because if you think of in 1994, we did not have 22 and 23 weeks surviving. We did not have nitric oxide. We had different ventilators, equipment and so forth. So one can argue that for the baby in 2021, these data probably don't help us and these trials probably should be expired. The other fundamental concern and something that has not really been articulated well is that when you look particularly at medical trials, one of the unfortunate consequences of medical therapy is that medical therapy doesn't always work and we don't necessarily adjust for that. The final point I want to make with respect to the, for the, to the literature is the issue of equipoise. We assume in trials that the patients randomized are comparable to the patients that were 
currently looking after. This is a post hoc study of the PDA Tolerate trial that Melissa and Ron published. Up to 35% of the patients who were eligible were not enrolled. And the reason they were not enrolled was because of physician equipoise. Those babies were younger, those babies were smaller, sicker, less likely to have antenatal steroids. But interestingly, those babies were treated and treated early. And their rates of the composite outcome of death or BPD or were significantly enhanced, suggesting that perhaps we really are not or have not studied the patients of interest. So why do we need to think about the lung? And why is it important in defining population of interest? Well, if you look at patients that have a large amount of blood flowing across the ductus, the two consequences are excessive pulmonary blood flow and systemic hypoperfusion. Excessive pulmonary blood flow, uh, just like our babies with congenital heart disease, single ventricle physiology, will lead to uh, alterations in lung compliance, prolonged ventilation, and so forth. And if we think of BPD, and again, I am not an expert on BPD and do not claim to be an expert on BPD, uh, but we know that the uh, BPD is really it's a physiologic continuum, but that physiologic continuum is not just about lung parenchyma. It's also about the pulmonary vascular bed. And there are many, many potential determinants ranging from the classic risk factors of fetal inflammation to prolonged ventilation and oxygen and so forth. But the ductus has been, you know, for a long time, recognized as an important association. So why might this association be important and what might be the key factors if we we're to think of the ductus in a much more thoughtful manner? And I believe the key factors are two things. One, what is the magnitude of the shunt? There are some patients perhaps who have very low volume shunts in which there really is a negligible impact, but perhaps high volume shunts and high volume shunts that are prolonged may be more relevant. And what are the biological factors that may be relevant with respect to the lung? Well, one is excessive blood flow. And the second is excessive blood that is at a much higher PO2. And we'll come back to this in a moment. The second reason you may be worried is pulmonary venous hypertension and the impact uh, from a back pressure perspective and a loading of the left heart on the immature lung. So in the face of pulmonary overcirculation, and again, if we draw parallels from our patients with congenital heart disease, um, the potential for intimal thickening, medial wall hypertrophy, leading to pulmonary arterial hypertension has biological plausibility. But is there any evidence of this? Well, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say there is, but it's really, really old. Uh, we've actually known since 1953 that you know, this is a study of um, kind of uh, young adults with prolonged exposure to PDAs. And they report in this study fairly significant increased muscularization of the pulmonary vascular bed. And why this is incredibly important. And, you know, one of the, one of the concepts that we push in hemodynamics is the importance of physiologic and phenotypic profiling. And in the subpopulation of patients with BPD who have chronic pulmonary hypertension, it's important to recognize that elevated pressure is the combination of flow times resistance. And we typically think of resistance in isolation of flow. But if you think of our chronic patient population, many of them may have chronic shunts, not just PDA, but also the role of the atrial septal shunt. And if this is what's driving pressure, then you need to modulate flow. Versus other populations, such as those with downstream systemic hypertension, who may have a post-capillary pulmonary vascular disease that may require systemic vasodilation. So the relevance of the ductus to not just BPD, but chronic pulmonary hypertension is important to recognize. So why biologically is important? Well, nobody here will question the relevance of excess of oxygen to the immature lung. There's both animal data and human data that, and uh, this is some data from a, a rodent model that shows significant increase in both fibrosis, impaired alveologenesis, and increased pulmonary vascular bed, muscle thickening. However, as mentioned before, 
one of the phenotypes of PDA is excessive pulmonary blood flow. And here, just to show you an example, the image on the left is pulmonary vein flow in a patient with a closed duct. You can see the peak velocity is around 0.3. Look at this patient here who has a torrential PDA shunt. There's almost a trebling of pulmonary venous return. And it's important to remember that the lung is exposed to blood with a higher PO2. So in our aspirations to minimize oxygen exposure, the presence of a big shunt is actually delivering much more oxygenated blood to the lung. So what evidence do we have of the impact to the immature lung? The image on the left is from the primate model, and this is a, a study in which they uh, close the ductus early, and you can see that QPQS normalizes in the patients in whom the ductus was eliminated. Those patients had got lower lung compliance. Interestingly, the patients with prolonged exposure to high volume shunts with increased QPQS also had abnormal lung compliance. But of more interest, when they looked at the lungs of these patients at 36 weeks gestation, what they actually found was that there was an increase in alveolar simplification, fibrosis, but also an increase in muscularization, suggesting that in the primate model, which really is the one that reflects the human physiology, prolonged exposure to shunts that cause major dysregulation to QPQS is probably not a good thing. What evidence do we have from humans? Well, this is a study we conducted um, kind of in Toronto, kind of around 2015, where we looked at the worst shunts and we looked specifically at patients who had um, prolonged shunts that ultimately needed surgical ligation versus prolonged shunts in which medical therapy was successful. And what you can see is that the ligation population had much higher respiratory requirements. This is mean airway pressure, the FiO2 and respiratory severity scores were also very similar. But most interestingly, if you track this back as early as the first two to three days of life, you can see that there's separation. These patients had higher respiratory requirements even in the transitional period, which may be important, and we'll come back to this. So in 2007, okay, we published this Sentinel paper um, Arvind Segal and I kind of, in which we basically said that we need to think of this problem beyond ductal size. We need to recognize that there are situations, okay, in which if you close the duct, you're probably going to harm the patient. There may be heart dysfunction, there may be pulmonary hypertension, uh, in which the ductus has a biologically important role. We're interested in patients who have big shunts, that are leading to physiologic dysregulation, and those perhaps are the patients we need to target. So we propose this model that assessment should not just be about PDS size and directionality, but we need to measure many things that collectively tell us that there's increased QPQS, there's loading of the pulmonary circulation, loading of the left heart, and there's compromise to systemic hypoperfusion. And some people have argued, why do we make this so complicated? Well, I would argue that medicine is about precision. It's about making the right decision. The more superficial the assessment, the less likely you are to be diagnostically precise that there's a, a particular problem. A PDA physiology is all about volume of flow and having a collection of markers that have the same directionality. So if many of these markers tell you that there's physiologic disturbance, you're more likely to believe that the shunt is a problem. So do we have any evidence that scoring or staging the system has got some value? And we actually do. This was probably the first study that Arvind published um, kind, of, kind of around 2010, where he looked at a small cohort and basically looked at high-grade shunts, which would be classified kind of based on that criterion as kind of the, the, the C3, E3, C4, E4 type shunts. And those shunts were associated with prolonged exposure to oxygen and a trend towards increase in BPD. We did not look at chronic pulmonary hypertension in these patients. This data was also subsequently studied in another patient population. And this is the work from the Italian group, Shane et al., um, where they also demonstrated that the presence of a high-grade shunt, E3, E4, was a strong predictor of BPD. 
And this data is fairly telling. And they basically reported that for every day, you have exposure to a very high volume shunt, the risk of BPD increased by 8%. 8%. So on a weekly basis, that risk was 70%. Again, observational data, however, suggesting that prolonged exposure to high, the highest volume shunt is probably what we're interested in. And that concept was then recently further kind of emphasized by another post-hoc analysis of Ron Kleiman's uh, PDA tolerate trial, where they basically showed that in the intubated patients who uh, required prolonged intubation, um, who reflect probably a higher risk patient population clinically, who had more prolonged exposure to high volume shunts, there was an increasing relationship with duration of exposure to the more severe forms of BPD. Very briefly, and again, just to, to drift, but just to further emphasize the importance of prolonged exposure, I just wanna share with you, and, and I know recently many of you would have heard from kind of uh, my colleague, John Klein, about the Iowa data on tiny, tiny babies. And we're, I'm very privileged to lead this program where we have exceptional survival rates at 22 and 23 weeks. But one of the things we were interested in over the last couple of years is to look at the relationship between prolonged exposure to retinopathy of prematurity. And part of the reason for this study, very similar to the lung, it's important to recognize that the eye is perfused by preductal cardiac output. And as you already know, cardiac output will increase with increasing volume of shunt. So the eye in essence is exposed to more blood, but more blood with a higher PO2. And interestingly, when we looked at the relationship between the composite outcome of death or severe ROP or ROP in survivors, PDA shunt and high volume shunt was a very strong associated after adjustment for all of these factors here, such that a PDA score of 78, and we'll come back to this later on, which reflects seven days of exposure to a high volume shunt, predicted ROP with a very high sensitivity and specificity. So prolonged exposure is important. So what is the optimal time of intervention and how do we move from where we are today? Well, currently the AAP statement suggests that early routine treatment to induce closure in the first two weeks does not improve long-term outcomes. Now, I would argue that this statement is very much based on previous trials, trials that probably should be expired that don't really help us answer this question. The fundamental thing one needs to think about is that there are entities like intraventricular hemorrhage, hypotension, pulmonary hemorrhage, which have been strongly associated with PDA. If you intervene beyond day seven, you're not going to be able to modulate any of these outcomes. Entities like neck BPD, which have also been associated with um, PDA exposure, are confounded by many things like infection, um, other uh, morbidities that happen. Um, so that the concept is perhaps we need to think about if we are to strive to minimize these problems, perhaps we need to think a little bit earlier. So what evidence do we have that the early ductus is a problem? Well, this is a Danish study that I had the privilege to collaborate with where they basically showed that the presence of a large PDA on day three of life was associated with an increase in both mortality, severe IVH, and necrotizing enterocolitis. The problem with early assessment is that it's imprecise. Parameters such as heart murmur, pulse pressure, really don't help you solve this problem. This is a nice study from a UK group where they looked at patients who had uh, big shunts after day seven recognized. And what they did was they looked at the clinical parameters in the first week of life that predicted late treatment. The only parameter that was associated with late treatment was metabolic acidosis. And certainly in our experience, metabolic acidosis is a important determinant, obviously of appraisal of the inadequacy of systemic hypoperfusion. But most of the parameters that we see fall into these categories worsening ventilation, increasing FiO2, hypotension, metabolic acidosis. You can manage these things from a symptom-based perspective, but neonatology needs to move away from symptom-based care. 
to think more about diagnostic precision. And these constellation of symptoms may reflect PDA, but may also reflect pulmonary hypertension, heart dysfunction, sepsis. And our goal is to provide not just care, but to provide the best care, which requires the highest degree of diagnostic precision. It becomes very difficult when you're trying to look at the relationship between outcomes and symptoms. And we've learned this lesson from hypotension, for example. Better ways to do this are to define the phenotypes and look at the relationship between phenotypes and outcomes. So one of the other arguments in the AAP statement was that the ductus is not a problem biologically and physiologically in the first week of life because pulmonary vascular resistance is elevated. This has not been our experience. This is a baby who is six hours old. And even by six hours, you can see the flow is all left to right. There's very dil marked dilation of the left heart and there's compromise to postductal flow with an increase in reversal in the postductal arch, which is one of the most sensitive markers of shunt volume. This concept that the ductus truly is an issue early on was reiterated by another UK study where they did an echo, which was blinded to the clinicians in the first 24 hours of life. And they then looked at the relationship between late treatment and the findings of that echo. And what they basically found was that patients who ultimately required therapy beyond day seven had large PDAs on day one of life. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at, and this is a observational study we conducted both in Canada and Ireland with Afif al um, what we can see is that there's two categories of patients. There are some babies who have large PDAs on day one that will close spontaneously. There are others that stay open. But the most telling findings here is that those babies identify themselves biologically. As pulmonary vascular resistance falls, the shunt volume will increase. And what you can see here is those patients, as early as the first 24 to 48 hours, have high flow in the pulmonary veins, have high left ventricular output that continues to rise, and they already have compromised diastolic flow to the descending arch, to the bowel, and also to the brain suggesting that early echocardiography can help identify subpopulations at increased risk of abnormal profiles. And in this same paper, we looked at the relationship between um, a composite of echo markers, and this particular score was strongly associated with the composite outcome of death or BPD, such that a score more than six predicted this risk with a high sensitivity and specificity. It's important to look comprehensively. And uh, once upon a time, we thought that the atrial septum may actually uh, inhibit the reliability of the echo. We recently just published a paper in JAST to actually suggest the opposite, that the atrial shunt is actually probably a physiological manifestation of bigger PDA shunts. And what you can see here is patients who have, in the first few days of life, larger PDAs and larger atrial communications actually have the highest volume of shunts. Pulmonary vein flow, cardiac output, compromised flow to the descending arch were all uh, much more pathologic in the presence of a large atrial communication, suggesting that an atrial communication in the presence of a PDA is another echo marker of hemodynamic significance. And what further adds to the argument and to the interest here is when we looked at the relationship of kind of PDA score, PDA diameter, and also atrial communication to um, uh, the risk of BPD or death, the presence of a large atrial communication in the first few days of life is an important parameter that we need to take care of and need to think about. So now thinking about what modulates flow. And I think this is one of the most underappreciated concepts with respect to PDA. We traditionally have thought of PDA closure in terms of giving drugs, drugs to close the ductus, but flow is determined not just by size of the vessel, although that's very important. It's cubed. Pressure difference, viscosity and length also will increase the magnitude of the shunt. Um, 
So what evidence do we have uh, of early intervention that may be beneficial? Well, probably the best study is, are the trials of prophylactic indomethacin, which show a reduction in surgical ligation and a reduction in severe hemorrhage. However, there was no improvement in long-term neurodevelopmental outcome. The question that remains is, well, how was indomethacin efficacious? Was this PDA dependent or PDA independent? And it's a highly controversial era. However, I would argue that from a biological perspective, an intervention that has a very short-term effect is highly unlikely to stabilize the germinal matrix of the brain. And there may be other factors at play here that influence this relationship. The other thing that's important is why did it not improve neurodevelopmental outcome? Was there something about giving in the medicine that could pen, pen, potentially have harmed other patients? We have definitely some data, again, it's very old data. This is Bob Cotton's original study, which basically showed that early closure also surgically uh, was associated with improved respiratory outcomes. However, again, this is 1978. The relevance today is highly questionable. One of the most important questions to me is what happens when you stop using prophylactic indomethacin? And this is some of the UCSF data. If you focus on the top left graph in babies who are less than 25 weeks gestation, here is arrow one. You can see the rates of prolonged PDA exposure beyond day seven of life were only 10 to 15%. When they stopped using prophylactic indomethacin, you can see that by day seven, 80% of shunts were still large, although that number with medical therapy did close kind of over time. But the most important factor is when they looked at the relationship between PDA, and this is just size, and versus PDA constriction, patients who had large PDAs on day seven had a twice the risk of BPD and this did persist, although not statistically significant, the numbers became smaller, the sample size is less as time went on as more patients PDAs closed, but that risk persisted, that patients with long, more prolonged shunts were more likely to have BPD. The impact was not just BPD, just very briefly. Uh, here you can see that after stopping prophylactic indomethacin, the instance of refractory hypotension was increased and that was associated also with the presence of a moderate to large PDA. The only trial of um, early, placebo uh, trial of, of early therapy um, um, that kind of has recently been uh, published that's, that looked at kind of meaningful clinical outcomes was Martin Klockow's DETECT trial, um, which looked at infants who were randomized, but just randomized on the basis of diameter, which uh, it's probably a little bit too simplistic in trying to appreciate the volume of the shunt. Nevertheless, um, the administration of early targeted indomethacin reduced pulmonary hemorrhage, reduced late therapy. It did not change the primary outcome, uh, but was underpowered for the primary outcome as in Australia, they ran out of indomethacin. But one of the interesting things for me was this significant although not statistically significant, there was a threefold reduction in severe interventricular hemorrhage. And when I moved to the University of Iowa in 2018 to this incredible program with so many tiny babies surviving, this suddenly became a concept we were interested in. Uh, because although those babies survived, up to 25% had significant interventricular hemorrhage. So I just want to take you for a couple of minutes on a slight tangent, which is what is the relationship of shunt to interventricular hemorrhage? And what is the cardiovascular argument uh, for uh, modulating flow? We know that low cardiac output in the first few hours of life is associated with bad hemorrhage. This is some data from Shahab Nouri's um, non-invasive cardiac output monitoring study. Babies who have stable cardiac output for the transitional period did not get IVH. Babies who started off with low cardiac output that increased rapidly in the first 48 hours of life were more likely to get severe IVH. So how might IVH be modulated, at least in part, by the presence of a large PDA shunt? Well, as mentioned, after birth, 
you remove the placenta, which is a low resistance capacitance organ. The left heart is now having to pump blood against a higher resistance, so you will have a low flow state. However, if the ductus remains open, as pulmonary vascular resistance falls, you're going to have an increase in the left to right shunt. You're going to have an increase in pulmonary venous return. So your cardiac output is going to rise. That cardiac output will be preferentially delivered to the brain. So the question is, is a open shunt with, as PVR falls, is that modulating an ischemia reperfusion event? And what's particularly interesting about this argument is if you think of the early trials of surfactant, nitric oxide, high frequency ventilation, all of which change PVR fairly radically, all were associated with an increased risk of IVH. So this is our hemodynamics room at the University of Iowa. We now are up to three echo machines. We have four faculty. Uh, we do kind of 90% of all the imaging work in the NICU. We do over 1,200 consultations. And as mentioned, this question to me became incredibly important. How can we better provide stability for the circulation in that first 24 hours of life? So we screen all our tiny babies and have done this now for uh, over 18 months. And based on the physiology, we provide physiology specific care. So if there's heart dysfunction, we will manage that. If there's pulmonary hypertension, we will manage that. If there are moderate to large PDAs based on our echo scoring system, which again is comprehensive, uh, we will use Tylenol to modulate the shunt. This is a score that we use. And if the infants have a score of more than six, which reflects a moderate to high volume shunt, we will provide early targeted intervention. Why Tylenol? Well, Part of the reason for, for Tylenol was internal concern. We use prophylactic hydrocortisone uh, for the first 48 hours in many babies. So concern about the potential risk of intestinal perforation. And, but also if you look at Shobik Mitra's kind of heat map study, kind of Tylenol kind of seemed to be a strong predictor of modulating vessel size in the first few hours of life. And, What's particularly interesting about how Tylenol works is this is some work we conducted in Toronto where we looked at the impact on pulmonary vascular tone. We know from another study we did with Jeff Reese several years ago that it takes incredibly high doses of Tylenol to vasoconstrict the ductus. But what you can see here is that it has a vasoconstricting effect on the pulmonary vascular bed. So we believe that the reason Tylenol is working is that it's keeping your pulmonary vascular resistance a little elevated, which decreases the transductal pressure gradient and decreases flow across the duct to allow spontaneous closure to occur. So what's been our experience? And we've now studied over 150 babies. Okay, let me talk about some of the findings. So first, only 40% of patients actually have a ductus that's concerning. And these are babies less than 27 weeks gestation. I forgot to mention that. We don't screen the, 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 the older babies on day one. So that up to 40% of patients actually have a relative contraindication, one could argue, to PDA closure. They may have heart dysfunction, they may have pulmonary hypertension. So closing those PDAs with prophylactic indomethacin may induce harm. If we look at the primary reason for doing the study, this graph on the top right shows intraventricular hemorrhage. The green is the Vermont Oxford network for babies less than 24 weeks. The yellow is Iowa before the program. The orange is Iowa after the program. So you can see that even though our survival rates are much higher for tiny, tiny babies, our rates of severe IVH are the lowest in the network. Even for babies less between 24 and 26 weeks, you also see a very dramatic reduction in the instance of severe hemorrhage. Now, why is it relevant to today's, today's talk? Well, it's relevant to today's talk because one of the su two surprises we got were one, um, a fairly substantial reduction in the instance of severe BPD and a substantial reduction in the rates of necrotizing enterocolitis, such that our rates of neck are only 1% now. 
which were unintended, unanticipated benefits of early targeted intervention. Our use of dopamine was reduced by 90%, our ligation rates have fallen. So again, this is not a randomized controlled trial. This is a single site center, which has introduced a program in which we are now monitoring the impact of that program. But there is so much standardization to this. I think this data carries a lot of value. The final thing I want to mention is, um, and again, this is an important concept when thinking about trials, is when you randomize patients to a therapy, does the therapy actually, has it actually achieved its goal? And we have translated, again, based on the meta-analysis, the lack of efficacy of studies from the 70s and the 80s and 90s into PDA is not a problem, okay? However, medical therapy doesn't always work. And um, we have a manuscript that is going to be coming out soon, um, um, which um, is a post hoc analysis of a randomized controlled trial that we have just published uh, as a feasibility trial, looking at early targeted intervention based on our PDA score. And again, small sample for the original trial, it was a pilot trial, 30 patients per group. We did not see a reduction in the composite outcome, not surprisingly. However, if you look here, and again, again, granted the numbers are small, in patients in whom early targeted intervention was successful, meaning by day seven, the ductus was closed, compared to patients in whom you failed with medical therapy or the patients who got placebo, you can see that the patients who had intervention success had the lowest risk of the composite outcome and also BPD, suggesting that solving the problem early is important. And again, we've already talked about the Shana study. How can we definitively solve this problem becomes important. And one of the potential solutions to definitive closure is percutaneous device closure. The percutaneous device closure data provides some additional interesting insights. This is some work from the Memphis group who have got the largest experience kind of in the world. And because they do cath closure, they can also look at the pulmonary vascular bed. And what they found was patients in group three who reflected the most prolonged exposure to PDA more than eight weeks at the time of cath had much higher PVR. And after cath closure, their time to respiratory recovery post-procedure was much more prolonged. Again, adding to the evidence that we have to be careful with prolonged exposure, that we're increasing the risk of dysregulated pulmonary vascular disease. We're potentially contributing to more chronic pulmonary hypertension that can make the management of these patients much more difficult. Um, we've, uh, this is unpresented data at this point in time based on an abstract we've just submitted to PAS here at the University of Iowa. And again, this is based on our surgical uh, data where we look at all babies after PDA closure in the first hour and we provide a targeted prophylaxis with milrinone based on echo evidence of heart dysfunction. Important to remember that cath closure, it's not a benign thing from a, at least from a lung perspective. We did not see any major hemodynamic instability after the administration of targeted milrinone. However, you can see that the patients many of them still had an in, a late increase in FiO2, a late increase in their respiratory severity score, suggesting that probably related to LV pressure and pulmonary venous hypertension, uh, there are still major physiologic changes that go on after PDA closure. And this is the echo data that bears that out, that again, one hour after closure, there is still substantial impairment in uh, and this is left heart function. Again, you don't need to know about these measurements, but several measurements showing both with conventional echo and advanced strain analysis that LV contractility is significantly impacted. And these graphs over here reflect the stress velocity relationship, which is how much does afterload explain the impairment in heart function? And the slope of these lines is significantly increased, um, uh, suggesting that afterload truly is the major determinant of LV dysfunction in these babies. So to wrap up, 
PDA is associated with major neonatal morbidity. However, an imprecise, indiscriminatory approach to treatment is not beneficial. I believe that there is a target patient population. It's most likely to be seen in the smallest babies. I think the money is in babies less than 20 five weeks gestation mostly. However, there are babies at 26, 27, and 28 weeks that may benefit from PDA closure. However, I believe early targeted intervention is the way to go. There is still meaningful data to show an improvement in pulmonary hemorrhage and latent need for therapy based on randomized trials. However, late medical therapy is only effective in 50% of cases. Enhanced diagnostic precision, with careful identification of the patients of interest with early targeted intervention is probably most likely where we're going to find a meaningful benefit in terms of BPD. However, word of caution, when we think about BPD in the year 2021, we need to recognize that not all BPD is just lung injury. We need to think about pulmonary hypertension. We need to think about systemic hypertension with pulmonary venous disease. And we also need to think about uh, shunts like ASDs and PDAs. So I thank you very much. Uh, I hope people enjoyed the presentation and I am going to be, you can see I'm in scrubs. I'm gonna go off and have to do my rounds now, uh, but I will join everyone hopefully for the uh, moderator session in a couple of, a couple of hours. Thank you very much.